Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to thank you for coming to SciArc to hear our distinguished lecturer this evening, Mr. Robert Stern. By way of brief introduction, Mr. Stern was educated at Yale and Columbia, where he has been teaching since 1970, as well as maintaining a private practice in New York City. He has authored several books, including New Directions in American Architecture, George Howe, and the most recent, co-authored with Deborah Nevins, The Architect's Eye. Mr. Stern has also organized several drawing exhibits and currently is the American coordinator for the 1980 Venice Biennale. His works are internationally published in several architectural journals and his drawings have been exhibited at the Drawing Room in New York City and of late at the EC Gallery in Venice. Anyone who is familiar with the work of Robert Venturi may see common interests in their architecture. Although many of us have not had the opportunity to experience Eastern vernacular, Mr. Stern's works make use of this tradition in combination with reference to European styles of the past. Not only does Mr. Stern create handsome architecture, but his role as an individual is that of a cosmological orchestrator of the postmodern movement. Ladies and gentlemen, the presence of the past, Mr. Robert Stern. Very good. Okay. To prove that I am a cosmolo what was that? <laughs> I, I'd like you to all know that this thing hiding behind cardboard designed by Frank Gehry is actually a music stand. Um, I always wanted to be the leader of a big-time band. Um, thank you, and I'm sorry that uh, this room is um, so crowded, and, um, but, but it's, it's nice to have all you people here. I hope I will um, be worthy of the occasion. Uh, I would like to talk to you tonight about some ideas with regard to the dread term postmodern, which I have to be very careful about because Charles Jenks is here, and he'll leap right up and correct me if I even so much as suggests some wrong interpretation to the phrase. But I would like to talk to you in a way about two or three different, though related, things. First, I would like to give you a, a quick survey, if you will, or a kind of uh, art history lesson um, of, of an idea about the continuity of historical forms, which I believe to be valid now as ever. Then I would like to show you some projects some of which you know that have been built, some of which you may have seen in the little exhibition, um, which I have not seen, at, um, that the SciArc students put together. And the final thing I'd like to end with some slides of a work of another architect whom I admire. Uh, it's a slight reversal. Uh, the usual role is that you um, show um, the work of some architect who's great from history, and then you show how you're the logical successor. Um, <laughs> I have that streak of immodesty in me, and it will sneak out all too readily. But um, I thought I would end with a historical architect um, whom I think highly of and I think has certain lessons for us at this moment. Um, if we could have the first slides, perhaps we could uh, proceed. What I would like to suggest to you is, well, are a number of things having to do with the history. This blue light is um, part of the the uh, TV uh, thing, so I'm not much we can do. I hope you can see the slides. Um, uh, there are, in my, I would like to define a few terms. We use a term called modern architecture very sloppily. We say modern architecture to mean contemporary architecture, which clearly is not a proper definition of it. We sometimes use the term modern to define the architecture of the 1920s to 1970s represented by such, uh, the work of such men as Gropius, Le Corbusier, and Mies. I would argue that that's modernism, that, that abstraction, that dematerialization of structure, that anti-historical stance, that uh, rather uh, naive belief that the materials of the building and the function intended to be housed within are the sole proponents of architectural form, uh, whether honored or not in actual buildings, but certainly talked about in writings, can be said to be what modernism was about, I would say that is a phase of modern architecture, but not modern architecture itself. Modern architecture, I would define as that continuum 
of architectural form that begins in the Renaissance. Uh, it's parallel to modern history, which also begins in the Renaissance. It begins with the um, break up of the uh, unitary Gothic tradition, um, the tradition of, um, uh, that we're familiar with from the Gothic architecture and from the uh, dominance of religious life in Western Europe. Uh, I would, without getting too complicated, and we had a lot of interesting conversation this afternoon in Eric Moss's uh, studio about the relationship between America and the Western European tradition and so forth, let us for the moment uh, think of ourselves as Western Europeans. In any case, with the beginning of the Renaissance comes a new perception about architectural form, which is that form is defined in terms of something that was thought dead and over, that is the classical past. And with the Renaissance, you have a revived classicism. Uh, at the same time, with the Renaissance, I know what I forgot. Wait a minute. I hope I'm stronger than Susanna Torrey. I understand she couldn't get them to move forward. Um, well, I'm not any much stronger than Susanna Torrey, it turns out. Now, oh, come on, guys. Can someone uh, do something with the left-hand one? Thank you. There's, there are three strains in modern architecture, I would argue. And this is an oversimplification, but, but I hope you will uh, stand with, bear with me. One is the classical, revival of the classical architecture because the classical past is seen to embody the highest ideals of Western civilization, man-centered, um, uh, nobling a great public architecture. The second characteristic of modern architecture taken in the broad way is a nostalgia for the vernacular. A, the vernacular always seen as somehow better because purer and not mucked up by architects. Um, uh, the vernacular seen uh, when always looked at the direct building of man in his, to make his own shelter, his own cities and towns. Uh, that can be seen, the first slides were the Roman Forum, of course, which was the representation of the classical ideal, seen, by the way, as, as a ruin, which makes it easier to accept. Um, the second pair of slides you see now is the uh, buildings, the little village, the mock village that Marie Antoinette built at Versailles, uh, the little hamlet. And here she played milkmaid, of course, and represented at a colossal scale the nostalgia each and every one of us, architects and real people alike, feel for some purer world um, uh, of um, somewhere where architects and education and learning and all the problems of modern life don't really play a part, um, where things were directer and, and more simple. The third, I think the left side, all oh, right, that's correct, but the left side, somebody's gonna have to advance by hand. Uh, the third constituent um, uh, aspect of modern architectural perception is the obsession with technology. Uh, we realize in the modern period that we can build things in more complex and sophisticated ways, less direct ways than we ever could before. Architecture learns from techniques established in machine production for goods, for transportation, and so forth. And um, we have become enamored with the technological process. At the same time, we have become both uh, victimized by it. Uh, we have, uh, as architects, we are much less in control of the process of building. Hence, we look at the, no the with nostalgia at the vernacular, which is so much more direct. We have become um, 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 alienated from our um, places by the possibilities of technology. Un unchecked technology has led to a kind of air-conditioned world where everywhere is the same, and we are all very concerned about that right now. Nonetheless, the interaction between these three um, uh, situations uh, in modern times um, is what modern architecture in the broad sense is about. Now, of course, those of you who have mistakenly read Gideon's Space, Time, and Architecture, um, <laughs> Uh, know that Gideon talked about transitory facts and con this constituent facts. Transitory facts are the ones that didn't fit into his theory. Constituent facts are the ones that led to his version of what architecture should be about, the international style, and was basically obsessed with the technological aspect. So that the Crystal Palace was seen as the uh, prime expression in the 19th century of modern architecture, whereas other uh, equally um, 
resolved and beautiful and meaningful works of architecture were dismissed as the aberrations of people who just didn't know which way was up. Uh, I oversimplify, but actually, if you read the book, I think you will find that there is much um, in, in my argument that is true. Now, if we return again to the idea of classicism, classicism being the embodiment at the highest level of Western humanist thought, where man is the measure of things, where man measures his achievements in modern times against an ideal, however fictitious, however spurious, however uh, made up, but an ideal that um, uh, deals with relationship of man to landscape, and man to um, in, operating individually and in a group, public architecture um, uh, at its highest level. Um, if you take the idea of classicism, you will, and you stop thinking about it the way we were always taught to think, at least I was when I was educated in, in our history of art, that the Renaissance was different from the Baroque and so forth, but you see it as a continuity. You see it as Renaissance classicism, as expressed here in the uh, uh, Pazzi Chapel, and you see it as Mannerist classicism, whether it's Michelangelo's Porta Pia or the Palazzo del Te, or you see it as Baroque classicism, as in Castle Howard, or you see it as Rococo classicism, as in the Amalienborg Palace in Munich, or you see it well, you don't see it always as classicism. Classicism does not move forward uh, in, in that easy continuity into our time unless we three think our positions with regard to what has happened in the last hundred years or so. First of all, there has been an obsession with technology as a substitute for the relationship between high ideals and classicism and the vernacular. For example, if you were to take Palladio, um, Palladio is a marriage between the high art and the class and the f and of classicism and the vernacular farmhouse. You can sort of imagine Palladio going to Rome, falling in love with the great buildings of the Renaissance and Roman antiquity as in ruins, and coming back and grafting those forms onto the vernacular of his region in the Veneto. But in the 19th century, and in more so especially in, in the 20th century, there has been a focus only on the technological so that you get Lloyd Wright's chapel on the left or the so-called Blue Whale by Caesar Pelle on the right, which used technological imagery to convey meaning as opposed to imagery of the technology of, of classicism or the vernacular. Now, it often works and works very well, particularly in a building like the uh, Blue Whale. It is a kind of crystal palace. The crystal palace in the 19th century can be said to have been the first D&D &D building, a decoration and design building. All the tchotchkes of Western world were, were displayed there for everyone to see. And principally, that's what this building is about, as you well know, on the right. But it can also offer problems. It can lead to an oversimplified view of the building task, where um, inflatables and all kinds of uh, other techniques are used as a kind of substitute or a decorative way. This is a building by Victor Lundy um, in which inflatable entrances are made to kind of look like the Hollywood Bowl or, or um, the Radio City Music Hall and then you know just push a pin in it and architecture disappears. Um, <laughs> maybe that's good, I don't know, but it seems to me a very different tradition from the one I refer to as the classical. Um, on the right is another building by Cesar Pelli, which I find more problematic, less articulate about what happens. It's a city hall in San Bernardino. You know it very well, I'm sure. But if, it did, if you didn't, didn't say city hall, and you didn't know it was city hall, you might put a number of other less public, less salubrious translations, uh, I mean, uh, uh, meanings to what happens in this building. Um, the, the black sort of cellular quality of it might suggest other more nefarious activities. Um, technology, in that sense, can only go so far, I would argue, and sometimes in our time has been used as a substitute or as a kind of false signal for the meanings of architecture, the most appropriate meanings of architecture uh, in any given situation. Now, Le Corbusier and Mies were both trained in classical architecture. Um, and what they struggled with, and the, you see here the Villa Stein uh, by Le Corbusier of about 1927, what they struggled with was an attempt to take the classical grammar and to assign new forms to it, to in a way make up new words for a classical language, if you follow that analogy, which is, can be carried just so far. 
and, 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 and retain its meaning. I think there are many problems which you're very familiar with, one of which is that it's very hard to invent a language and get other people to understand it easily. Another of which is that the subject matter of the language, the industrial processes, perhaps were less meaningful to the users of architecture than, they were, than it was to the makers of architecture. Also, the struggle between the classical compositional methods, which are seen in the front facade on your left, and the uh, desire to find, make a more responsive architecture to particular location and movement situations in the building um, produce somewhat unresolved form um, uh, in, in many instances. Uh, I think um, one sees that struggle, whether one likes it or not, very clearly recorded in the plan and in the uh, way Le Corbusier shows the d demonstrates the proportioning system of the Villa Stein and on your left. Um, he uses a classical technique, for example, on your left to define the proportioning system, but in fact the windows and the, and the key openings that relate to human activity are anti-classical, very strangely proportioned in relationship to our, our body size, but only related to the production psychology that, make, that, that he felt was dominant in our Western civilization. Uh, now, the problem is more complex than we had been led to believe by historians. Gideon um, and others have oversimplified it uh, even more than I have, if, if that's imaginable, um, and I'm pretty good at that. Uh, here is Frank Lloyd Wright's building for the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. If I hadn't told you that and just showed you this rather grotty slides, these grotty slides of this, you would say this is a Beaux-Arts project, a late classical project of the 19th century. And I would argue indeed it is because certainly in its planning and in many of the representations of the plan in three dimensions, Wright, dealing with a large scale public commission, has to fall back on the classical language, which is the most refined and most fully developed language for the making of public form in, that we know as architects. But you could even go further, and you must remember that Wright did the Imperial Hotel just after coming back with Mrs. Cheney from their one year um, journey, or sojourn in, in the Italian hills, and after making the drawings for his great Vosmuth portfolio. And I'm sure that Wright just took his mind off the drawings every now and again and looked around. And I think that if you compare, in, in a vague way, the Pazzi Chapel on the right and its feeling for form, and you compared it with the centerpiece of the Imperial Hotel, uh, I think you can find a greater commonality than the myth that has grown up around Wright, which he was very helpful in fostering, um, would ever suggest. I think that just as a little historiographical problem, uh, we accept too many things that we're told in books or by our teachers, and um, except me, of course, you must listen to everything I tell you. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think if we use our eyes, I think certain things will occur to us that maybe um, are, are worth uh, considering more seriously. Now, there's another thing about the 19th century classicism that we have been allowed ourselves to be uh, uh, sort of um, to get us off the track. We were told that the classical forms were used because they were meaningless, but they were easy. Um, I would say they were both very meaningful and to do anything well, whatever it is, is never easy. But the classical forms, and this is Pennsylvania Station in New York, torn down in 1963, uh, when a few architects, Philip Johnson among them, uh, protested, uh, but nobody else seemed to notice, was a great complex building designed in 1906 by McKim, Mead, and White. Classicism here was used for a number of definite reasons. One. A classical building is a public building because the rhetoric of classical architecture has over thousands of years been developed to state certain relationships for the, at the public scale. More importantly, these great buildings of the 19th century being modeled after the great Roman buildings, for example, or combinations of those buildings, really could work with the programs and the complexities of 19th century architecture at an appropriate scale. On your left is the great waiting room uh, for the uh, uh, train where you got your tickets and sort of milled around waiting for your train to be called. Uh, on the right is the great uh, train room itself below this level. You actually descended stairs and got immediately onto the train. There are a number of interesting lessons here. First of all, it, 20th, 19th century technology is used with equal venturesomeness, uh, equal spirit 
of adventure, um, as in the Crystal Palace on the right. But it is restudied, as indeed the Crystal Palace was, in terms of traditional form to carry forward in a new material, in a new situation, the traditional meanings that classical form carry with them. So you get the same architecture restudied in stone and in um, uh, glass and iron. They are both restudied. Neither of them is a copy of anything else. Both are used to evoke some sort of meanings that just putting together walls and windows and so forth cannot do. And I think the lessons of these buildings, and there are many of the 19th and 20th century, is not, we don't want to save them just because they're old, but because they are truly complex and responsive. They usually combine one or more, two or more of the three constituent elements of modern times as I perceive them. Usually technology is brought to a high level of resolution in a classical light, for example, or the vernacular and technology are com contrasted and brought together in some way. The architecture is rich as opposed to that architecture of the recent past in which only one of the kinds of elements that I've been talking about is emphasized. A building is all about technology, as for example, Beaubourg in Paris might be. Or a building is all stiff classicism, as certain buildings of the 30s are, and they're equally dull and diagrammatic. But in the great buildings, two or more elements are brought together for a rich combination of form. Now, the situation is quite interesting at the moment. Um, be much more interesting than uh, 20 years ago when I was in architecture school, it seems to me, um, uh, because all of a sudden all kinds of shibboleths are really open for question, not only verbal ones, but actual images. On the left is Mises building project of about 1919 for a tall building. And for 50 or 60 years, that image has um, marked what is possible in a tall building. And many architects still continue to believe, whether you stand it up this way or you roll it on the side, uh, that that's what a glass and steel building is about. We were told that the representation of anything but the uh, just the facts man kind of um, attitude was, all, was, was no longer possible in tall buildings. Yet all of us, I think, share a certain romance, a love for the tall buildings of a downtown Chicago or, or for the New York City skyline in particular, in which the facts of the building were transformed or the technological facts were combined with an image from the past, usually the classical past, to make a building inhabit its height, take a position in the skyline and on the street that made it special and as part of a larger dialogue of form. AT&T by Johnson, now under construction, certainly changed everything around, opened up the whole conversation once again. And while it is probably not profoundly innovative in the sense that the discussion was on, by virtue of its size, the prestige of the client, the prominence of the site, I think it does cause us all to re-examine what it is we believe about architecture at this moment. Now, if we take, and I've been sort of uh, take, doing a version of what uh, Charles Jenks calls modern architecture bashing, um, but what, which I've been sort of um, propping up classicism and, and, and denigrating or trying to redress the balance between classicism and technology, that leaves the other, the third of the components somewhat in the air, vernacular the most difficult one for us to deal with. Because both the slides on the screen represent vernaculars that are operative in our American society and are very much ones that the populace in general has strong positions. The one on the right, the red barn in Connecticut, probably built by the highway department uh, just so the tourist cards can be photographed, is what we all want to believe is the vernacular, the true American genius of buildings. And you know, there is an adobe building in Arizona highways that goes with it and so forth. The one on the left is, if you believe a vernacular is the product of spontaneous action of a, of a civilization in the built environment, is certainly a vernacular. Uh, at the roadside strip, the ugliness and so forth. Now the Venturis have made us all painfully aware of the, this juxtaposition and have left us in an awkward position because, or left me, I can't say we left you, but they certainly left me. I hate the one on the left, but I've have been told I had to love it. So I've sort of found out that I've learned to, to deal with it 
and I'll try to show you a little bit later, but I can't quite go so far as to say it's the end product of Western civilization. <laughs> I certainly hope not. But it is a dilemma, and we're faced with the dilemma. And, and um, I think what it shows is that unbridled anything, if I showed you unbridled technology, you'd say it was wonderful, but if you see unbridled sort of applique technology at the vernacular level, I think you hate it. And I think it is the lack of dialogue between values, that, that the single-mindedness of the image on the left, which is the thing that makes it perhaps more than any other aspect of it visually offensive and culturally sinister. Now, there have been times in our society, architectural culture, I should say, when architects have combined the vernacular with the high art language of classicism, both with its syntactical aspects, how to compose buildings, make big rooms, small rooms, public spaces, and with its representational aspect to produce great work that really is both public and specific to American or local areas. The one that I know best and admire and have learned the most from is the shingle style of the late 19th century. Now, Charles Jenks will say, um, that it is only a substyle of the Queen Anne in England. I think that's a special um, argument. I think they're parallel moves. But I, I would say that the shingle style, as represented in the Newport Casino here, uh, in, in which is the uh, now the Tennis Hall of Fame in Newport, Rhode Island, designed by McKim, Mead, and White, approximately 102 or three years ago at the time of our centennial, and that is culturally important, represents a re-looking at the pre-colonial, pre-American uh, forms, the colonial, as opposed to the early Republican architecture. At the early Republican architecture, so you get the shingled, um, sort of sloped back roofs of the House of the Seven Gables with representations of Georgian architecture in the paneling and much more so if you go inside um, in, the, in the handling of the interiors. Other things brought from other cultures entirely like the French influence in the tower. A very clear planning, not sentimental, not mushy, not complicated or happenstancical, but very rigid and very clear on the scale of Roman planning or classical planning. If you examine this building, you might, in, in plan form, it looks like it comes out of Noli's map of Rome in certain respects. So you have many levels working together to produce a truly uh, indigenous expression, but not one that is without order and without broad modern implications in compositional terms. So the shingle style seems to me a very useful model. I think we could discuss um, good use work in Santa Barbara. We could discuss, uh, rather in, um, in San Diego, we could find other examples, but perhaps this is the most poignant because it goes right to the heart and the founding of our American culture. Now, if you take the line of reasoning I've sketched out, and um, follow it through, and you say that classicism is an ongoing tradition, that the relationship of classicism to technology or classicism to vernacularism or any of those three is a conscious act that the architect reading the situation has in charge, and that modernism was an anti-historical condition which said these readings were no longer valid. What do you do now in the so-called postmodern period uh, where you're once again reviving the idea of architecture as meaningful, what do you do in relationship to the forms of modernism? What do you do with all the stuff that took its position as being against everything, which now clearly seems a style? We can talk about the modernist style, and all of us know exactly what we're talking about. We're not in it, we're looking back at it. Well, my answer to that is simply that one can use it as part of a, the same linguistic uh, process. This is a, a, a remodeling and a, a renovation, a rebuilding, I don't know what the word is, um, a job uh, that was uh, <laughs> just been finished in New York in which the language of high modernism is used, particularly on the interior, uh, to, to represent what this particular job is about in the client's ideals, in my own feelings of what is appropriate to build just off Madison Avenue in the art gallery district in New York for people who want to show art and, and, and make a particular kind of environment um, uh, sympathetic to a particular kind of art, have a certain idea of form and space and so forth. You can use that. You can compose consciously in it. To be after modernism doesn't mean to be against modernism. 
the pr privilege of being against things, I hope, in the way that modernism was, I hope will be buried with the 50s and 60s and all of that sort of smug superiority that, that we seem to have had once in our architecture. I think we now must look at every situation afresh in relationship to the broader continuities of form and not in relationship to this um, uh, uh, idea that one style succeeds and cancels out another. It's a continuity. I would therefore say, um, to conclude that proportion of this uh, uh, talk that if we have Renaissance classicism, Baroque, Rococo, and so forth, there is also modernist classicism. Because finally, it seems to me the icons that we appear, that appeal to us from the 20s and 30s, Le Corbusier, Mies, and so forth, is a product of the classicist sensibility, classicist compositional techniques. Um, it marries classicist syntax and technological form however abstract, it lacks representations of classical architecture, but other than that, it is a kind of seceding, secessionist, if you will, classicism. We are now in the process of reintegrating to the broader tradition. In any case, in some of my own work, um, which is um, easier for me to talk about perhaps, oh, perhaps, uh, I have increasingly become aware of the fact that one works in some sort of condition of form that, has, that is a conscious one, that the conscious meanings one deals with in architecture are the most important ones. Um, so that the Lying House, which you probably know, which is the first of this succession of, of buildings that I still hope I'm very much involved with, in which one sets down not only the program and the site conditions and the need to manipulate light and space in an interesting way, but also one says, what does the building, fun how does the building function as a cultural object? The Langs or university people, they wanted a, a house that would relate to their interest in um, South German Baroque architecture in particular. Mrs. Lang said she wanted an archbishop's palace uh, from South Germany. Um, we won't go into why she did or not. It's not really any more important, it seems to me. How does one achieve that? One uses ornament, color, of course, to, to mac manufacture conditions that bring forward other conditions from the past in time. One discovers, when one actually visits a South German Baroque building, as I did a few years after doing it, that the ornament um, usually is concentrated on the front in the, in, the, in the real thing. This is in Rote am Inn near uh, Salzburg, between Salzburg and Munich, and you'll notice that all the ornament is painted on because ornament in most architecture, whether it's Miesian or a South German Baroque, is a representation of intentions uh, on the facade or on the vertical plane and is not the real realization of a condition. Um, ornament is a, is a decorative act for intended meanings. Um, one also learns that, the draw, that ornament can be made in very ordinary ways, just as it was in the 19th century, that many of the things we were told, someone today said in the studio, you can't do such a thing. And the one thing that I find is a particular challenge is when somebody says you can't do it, that you really can. For example, all this stuff is all available in lumber yards, at least in the east. I guess out here it's maybe done in Spanish style, but um, you can find this stuff. And, um, uh, you can make it and assemble it and, and continue to make architecture much as has been made before. The question is, what do you want to repeat the sayings of before? I think not. I don't advocate copying. I don't think when, well, I think there's plenty to say new in any given language. And the question is, what is the, uh, another question is how to relate to where you're building and why to make things that represent the past. For example, the Lang House, people always said to me, why didn't you make a red barn like you're supposed to have in New England if you didn't want a white painted house? Actually, the photo I showed you of the red barn was the barn the Langs were moving out of because they were going crazy living in this dark, dank, highly picturesque thing. Um, they wanted something that bespoke their a house. Now, in my mind, the Lang House is a, a Palladian villa. I saw it as the villa at Mosser, to be exact, on your left. Um, uh, uh, then people say, well, that's not very American. And I said, well, um, I thought a bit, and then I remembered the Longfellow Vassal. Vassal Longfellow House in Cambridge on Brazel Street, down the street from Harvard Square. It seemed that was pretty American to me. Uh, Longfellow wrote Evangeline and all those other 
uh, important things we study in the sixth grade. Um, and, and it's all made out of wood, which made me much happier because it wasn't real classicism, whatever that meant. It was an impression of classicism. Of course, it opened up another question. Isn't it maybe more classical and correct than the Parthenon, since the Parthenon, we were told, was a stone building made to imitate a wooden building? Here in good old America, we made a wooden building to recapture in the real material the original forms. <laughs> so you see, you can argue these things all different ways. So saying, the real source of the building is the, is the Governor Gore House in Waltham, Massachusetts by Bullfinch, which in the 19th century was stuccoed over uh, and, and painted a kind of cream color, and, but has been since restored back to brick. Um, the point of all this is that there is a continuity of language and form, and that you can't, these regionalisms, these the, the, this recent fashion for only solving things contextually where you take a molding from one building next door and a doorway from the other and you sort of weave it all together and the building is therefore wonderful is too simple. We always oversimplify as architects. We must always find the more complex, the more deeply rooted cultural condition if we can. When it's all finished, the Langs have their archbishop's palace represented across the facade as an announcement of intentions to arriving guests. And they have, on the other hand, a house which has the wonderfully conventional values of indoors and outdoor rooms and spaces, windows and so forth, places for the picnic table and what have you that makes it operate on many levels. So that I hope that the thing, I think the thing does succeed in that sense. Another house on a suburban side, a very large suburban side outside of New York, um, had, wasn't so easy in the sense that there was no message from the site. The owner didn't want a palace or anything particular, just wanted a, quote, modern house. And in fact, only had one request. She liked California houses of her um, youth. And she remembered to that, by that she meant the kind of easy indoor-outdoor relationship uh, we associate with Southern California. I show you the snow-covered slide on the right to <laughs> remind you that even those ideas travel um, um, and that the simplicities of a climate are not always uh, w happily worked together with the, with the demands of clients. One has to make accommodations. The complexity of the program um, led to an interesting plan, but the question was what the house would look like. How, what did it mean to make a house on this site which could have been anything? In my mind, the relationship that Wright achieved between building, particularly in his earlier work, between building and site, not the sort of mushy relationship of the later Taliesin and Algevana period in which the ferns grow right up into the house, but a, a house on the hill and terracing and a kind of Italianate feeling for form, which rep is represented by this slide of the earliest version of Taliesin um, North in Spring v Green, Wisconsin, seemed to be set one um, aspect. The second was, since we had to have a swimming pool, um, and there was a question of building in relationship to water, one, one thought of um, Italian villas, uh, such as the one on the right outside of Florence. Of course, that was, my mind was in that frame of mind because Wright himself had designed Taliesin after coming back from that famous trip to uh, Fiesole. And then looking at those villas, one discovers, as in, one discovers in Palladio, that the representation of form is done at a rather low key. A villa is something between a public building and a farmhouse. And, and if one makes representations that are meaningful and manageable, they will be kept on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so this villa on the right is somewhat grander than ours. It has fully developed sculptural program at the roof. Ours, um, rather more modest, has painted colors and bands and plying cornices, but a certain quality of ambition that takes it beyond the vernacular toward a kind of higher art expression. Certain objects that the owner had, this set of furniture by Paul Frankel, um, which was designed in California in 1934. Um, there's a, a wonderful art deco designer who lived here in Los Angeles. We built a room about around so that the room is an, an evocation of the thing that lives in it, the thing that happens in it, and not just some shape fighting it out tooth and nail with what goes on inside. Classicism, in a more overt way, has come to be more of a concern for me. To make buildings that look like buildings always used to look like. Uh, it's increasingly become interesting to me to be less eccentric I'm not, I don't know, this is sort of confessional time in California, I don't know why, but less eccentric and more normative. 
This is a townhouse on Park Avenue, which inside is a kind of, uses a kind of high language of modernism. At last, you can walk through a Juan Gris guitar um, and, and all the colors of those paintings for a kind of complex family life, three kids, two dogs, parents, the whole bit. On the outside, instead of representing that on the outside, would have been jarring and discordant on this facade of Park Avenue, one uses pilasters, an implied pediment in the center, certain um, torus moldings, and so forth, to represent at the scale of the house the same kind of architecture that, uh, that the architects used 20 or 30, 30 or 40 years ago building these apartment houses, which is, of course, part of a very long continuity of form. Uh, in, a con in a carriage house, which had been burned, um, and we had to re restore it, the question was, well, how to restore it? In point of fact, it never had a really good interior because it was designed for horses. They don't operate in the humanist tradition. Um, <laughs> I can't say that when I lecture in the Rockies, but um, it's, it's true. Uh, so we, my intention was to evoke in the interior the kind of interior that this house might have had had it been a house and not a carriage house in 1906, because, with the date it was built, to see um, um, what, how one could manipulate that language, which was a wonderful moment, which I continue to be interested in, when classicism was simplified to apply to domestic programs as a rule, uh, Wagner, Otto Wagner, um, uh, and, and Macintosh in, in Scotland, who was particularly uh, on my mind at the time this was done. So that Macintosh's apartment in Glasgow on the right, um, with its um, molding at about seven feet, uh, defining human height and uh, uh, helping to kind of tame the very high ceiling of the space was the model, and the room you see on the left is based upon that. Most of the columns you see, in fact, all but one in the room are non-structural. I don't know why I keep reminding people of that, but it seems to be helpful to release you from burdens, uh, <laughs> of your, not of your own devising. Uh, the moldings and all of that is new. Uh, the idea of that is to make a dialogue with the actually modern, i.e. modernist furniture of the room so that the continuity of things over time is emphasized and not some sense of just knowing exactly when everything happened in that room and dating it to the last moment, which seems to me arbitrary and not really representative of what we're about as people. The doorway and the two windows are new, are old, the rest is all new. Um, to, and, and, and is, an, is an attempt to um, uh, tie things together through, through this traditional language. The swimming pool is turned into a reflecting pool by um, uh, virtue of the two pavilions at the end in which the very simple uh, classical columns still available from a catalog, a sweets catalog, you can buy them. Um, uh, they also make flagpoles. Uh, the and always, you know, they just hold p pavilions. It releases all kinds of opportunities to make landscape and nature uh, come together in much more r relaxed and appropriate ways, I would say, than the language of high technology, unadulterated, that we had been so used to for so long. That easy relationship between traditional form and present situations is extended here in this lounge for the law school at Columbia. We were remodeling a building that had been very seriously vandalized over time by other departments of the university. And basically, <laughs> basically what we were presented with were some beams on the ceiling that had a little character and four windows, two of which you see, which were in the style of the building out the, st we, 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 the students were rather um, uh, sensitive to the general uh, lounge architecture of the, that university and others, which is this sort of butcher block, asparagus fern, um, thou shalt not spill anything, and therefore immediately you spill everything all over the place kind of architecture. And they felt that that was rather um, a put down to them. They were, they were graduate students and law abiding besides uh, being lawyers. So we tried, said, well, how can we do that? We tried to make a room that would go beyond that. We tried to make a room in this way that would prepare the lawyers for life downtown. We made a club room. <laughs> surprisingly, it's very, very successful. Not surprisingly, I should say. And then we extended the language established by the first windows using plywood, traditional moldings, which is, we sometimes fabricated and sometimes we're actually able to buy, and continued the language all around the room. Where we came to two places 
on either side of the fireplace, which was existing and, and had managed to weather all the uh, storms of the past 40 years, uh, where we came to those two places where it seemed to me in the past there would have been hortatory remarks carved in stone uh, from Blackstone or from uh, Emerson or somebody like that. We left the spaces blank because I don't think we could have had much um, agreement in the mid-70s as to what was appropriate. And I didn't quite know how we'd go about getting it carved anyhow, what with the death of Augustus St. Gordon's and his tradition. The only graphic designer I knew was Massimo Vignelli, who was frantically doing Bloomingdale shopping bags at the moment. And I, you know, I think we've lost that tradition. Another thing I've learned in the course of doing that project and the course of some of this work, it has to do with the nature of archetype and abstraction, which we talked about in the studio this afternoon. If you take a column and you take the capital off it and you take the base off it as the thing on the right, do you still have a column? I would say no, you have a post. And I think a post is a very inarticulate form compared to a column. If one re-investigates all of these other elements that constituted the architectural vocabulary, not just the simplest one, now whether we call it an archetype or an element is not important, uh, at this moment, but whether, if one goes back and examines the base, the chair rail, the moldings and so forth, one sees a truly rich and complex language. The, ones, the column on the right speaks in monosyllables without any adjectives and just talks like this. The one on the left kind of does a job of making you think of light and shade and sunlight, and I have to admit I waited a while for the photograph, but, but <laughs> it's there, and when you're sitting bored out of your socks uh, reading some book and trying to pretend that you're learning the law when you'd really rather be out doing something else, if you look at that, something is happening in front of you that is not happening on the right, and I do think architecture still is a visual art, and I'm not so embarrassed by playing up to the eyeballs every now and again. Now, in this question of the vernacular, and I, I, I should have prefaced this talk about 100 hours ago by saying I'd probably talk longer than um, Susanna Torrey, but I do have more slides. Um, <laughs> uh, we're colleagues in New York. Um, word will get back. Uh, probably before I'm there tomorrow. Uh, this is a house I did recently in Maine um, in which the issue of that shingle style, which I purport to be so admirous of, comes rather painfully to cause. It has increasingly in, in some recent works that are under construction. That is, around this house, which is very exposed to the landscape, are, uh, are many very, very fine examples of the shingle style from the 19th century. And due to a wonderful forest fire that enabled the house that was on the site to burn to the ground, um, <laughs> vandals actually, um, I was enabled to build this house completely exposed to every sightseeing boat coming around here going to see Nelson Rockefeller's house was around the corner. And it really is a put up or shut up situation for me. And I learned that one, the lesson I learned in the course of doing this, which is not as well reflected in the final design as I would like, is the pr role of representation. It is not enough to just use shingles. It is not enough to use the grammar of shingle planning, for example, in making the plan or any other style. One needs to represent very specific terms on the building, what, the art, what you have in mind. A pediment with recumbent figures automatically connects you with a tradition of form. Shingles help, but the, the, the arch, the capitals, all kinds of details really are necessary. I learned that in a quite interesting way in the inside um, where we came to doing a fireplace and I was able to um, convince the client, it didn't take much actually, they're always willing, they were just afraid the architect would never ask, um, to make a fireplace out of local main stone that comes called Main Stone. It actually comes from New Hampshire, but that's a detail. And then um, we struggled with how to design it. And the long and the short of it was, we finally talked to the contractor and he said, oh, we can do that. You don't have to draw that up. We know how to do it. We've just been waiting for 20 years for someone to ask us. And you see, these things are part of our architectural culture just as much as they are part of our real culture. And we are just need to release ourselves to deal with these issues in a positive way. Now, the representational issue comes to me 
its most awkward moment in these four columns, which are part of an eight-column baldacchino implied around this space. They are actually, some of them structural and some of them not, bracing the house. The chicken part of me did not permit me to make these columns in a classical language. They are actually just the steel posts, and I think they're very uh, in unresolved on that level, and it is a missed opportunity to bring the dialogue of the structure and the fireplaces into a more articulate um, role. So it goes, I, can, I mean, I can go on and on, I will go on and on. Um, <laughs> so, sometimes even I get tired of my own voice. Uh, this is a house that, that's a craftsman's cottage, which you have many of in Los Angeles, and this is one in New Jersey. There are quite a few around the New York area, and which we are, we've added onto, we've remodeled, and we've tried to keep the character, which was a very t slender thread by the time we got onto the job of the original, and bring it forward. Sometimes there's much, not enough there, and we have to invent, but it seems more uh, productive to work with what the, the, the original mood of a thing is than to try to lay another style on top of it. So these, in so looking at craftsman houses and, and, and thinking about what might have been in the minds of those people in 1900 and 1910, one begins to elaborate very ordinary things like doors and all the things of everyday life, going into a building, coming out, standing and waiting um, for someone to come to the door, letting light in from above can be open, can be rich, without being, I think, excessive and overly complicated. We had to do a new stair to the second floor, and the question is what the stair would be like. It seemed to me that the craftsman architecture was really a kind of pale reflection of the architecture of Voisy and Macintosh, which was um, the, most, the highest expression in England um, and, and, and most influential in the world. So I designed a stair based on this one of Macintosh's in the Glasgow Art School on the left. But when I finished it, I could not decide in my mind whether Macintosh had ripped me off or I had ripped Macintosh off. And I, I, I hoped that people would have that confusion, and it seemed to me not very important anymore. Who did it first? If one is just interested in the thing and it represents a continuity, I know that's very arrogant, but originality seems to me the killer of architecture. We sit at our desk and try to reinvent the wheel every Thursday afternoon. And <laughs> It's a waste of time. It's all been done better, and the smartest of us can pick up and build and go on and on, and um, not try to make it anew, as we had been taught by Ezra Pound. Um, this is a house under construction, which was in the exhibition in Martha's Vineyard, which brings up another problem. You had an opportunity to see the drawing, so I won't describe it too much, except to say that the facade, the centerpiece of the facade is borrowed uh, without permission from Schweinfurth's Unitarian Church in Berkeley, and that the general massing of the house is based on a railroad station by H.H. H. Richardson. <laughs> the reason of that for this being that the um, code in Martha's Vineyard has been brilliantly written now, uh, the architectural code has been imposed to prevent uh, architects from building the kinds of wondrous structures they built in the 1960s and early 70s, those pitchy poo, shed roofed, flying wedged um, things that were always in house and garden and record houses of the year, which caused a lot of attention and turned that place into one of the um, weirdest architectural landscapes in America. So in rewriting the code, they wrote it so that basically only architecture up to about 1910 was possible. And that's caused everybody a lot of trouble, but not me. Of course, it was my really good opportunity for me. But the irony of this house when it's finished is that around it will be all of these buildings that will look, quote, more modern than this. This house will look ancient once the shingles weather, and the others will look like the future. The future is now the past. The past is the future. I think this is a, um, an interesting condition. It's not rolling back the clock. There's nothing about this house that is copied, nothing about it that is pretending that somebody's going to be here in a hoop skirt or, a, or knickers or whatever. It is just that that tradition, that continuous tradition, which was uh, true of New England seacoast architecture for over 100 years, still has meaning, validity, and life. Uh, this was a house designed for someone, songwriter, a commuter between two coasts. Um, movie maker who wanted something that looked like some other houses. He wanted a house that was very traditional, like the houses on either side of his property on Long Island. He wanted a studio 
in the back, presumably to go and write his music to pay for the house in the front. And he wanted another place for the kids to play so they wouldn't mess up the furniture in the house, um, your basic American problem. He wanted a house that looked like this. And the question, you know, uh, we could have all tried to figure out a way to make a house that we could have pulled the wool over his eyes for a while until it was built, and he discovered it didn't look like that, and he would fire us, and there would be a lot of legal problems and unpleasantness. Or we could make a house that looked like that. It seemed perfectly reasonable. It's a nice house, why not? So we took that as the given. Why make something look like something you don't want it to be like or that the person doesn't want when you can find ways to take something and make it well, new, interesting, valid by restudying and really being an interpreter? I ask you these with a kind of big question mark because I have my, my, my moments of self-doubt I don't like to have them too many times on the platform. It's bad for the lecture business. But, but I think one has to ask these questions. Why make something looking like some other borrowed image, since I can't think of any architects I know who don't work in borrowed images of one sort or another. Why not make it one that looks like the buildings nearby and the thing that means something to the people who are going to live there and use it? In doing the little building for the studio, which was the building we explored the most before this project came to a stop. Um, it was easier for them to buy a house that looked like the house they liked than to build a house that looked like the house they liked. <laughs> Sick transit commissions. Um, in any case, in doing the studio, uh, one had, if one it was building the house that looked like the house of 1900, then the question of the studio became rather interesting because what I, I thought in order to really come up with an appropriate studio, what one should do is imagine what had happened since 1900. They'd built the house, they'd built a stable. Things went, changed rather quickly and it became the garage. The garage was okay, but they no longer could fit the cars into it because they were too big, so they converted it into a studio. So what we did was design a barn or a stable and then through a series of operations on the drawing board, converted it. We went through and you know, raised the dormer, let light in and made it into a kind of um, a garage, a nicer place. And then we made it, remodeled it once again in our minds in the process into the studio. And then we recorded some of those processes. For example, this big Palladian window opening the former closed interior of the garage to the garden because it was now human inhabited by uh, people um, uh, with, with a bold sort of change in scale. Or we recorded on the end gable through lattice work the shift of the original space, the overall volume when it was one thing and the need to put in a stair now and a door and to have only less of the space for the main uh, sitting area so you get the gable moving in on the left and recorded there. So one can, through again another form of continuity and rich architectural form. One can also, by looking at the continuity of form, realize that much has happened in America without the benefit of architects, but it is not without validity. It is that issue raised by the vernacular. These are proposals for a kind of ideal town. I am not without my ideals, but an ideal town based on what people in the real world, as opposed to architects, continue to value as images of inhabitation. This is a kind of subway suburb for, or for places like Watts or um, um, any, any kind of place that it was, was um, destroyed in the social unrest of the 60s, uh, area of marginal architectural development at the present, which could become a good place to live with, if the architectural and, um, forgetting about economics for a moment, if the uh, forgetting about who will pay for it, I shouldn't say that. These are intended as houses for low income people, but forgetting about that uh, governmental policy issue for a moment, if the peop architects could make images and houses that people would feel uh, uh, happy to live in as opposed to at odds with. So this is an intention, um, and it's a project I work on on and on. This is a project for a development corporation reg based here in Los Angeles uh, until recent financial stress has caused them to retrench and move back to New Jersey um, for houses for affluent people built by golf villas and uh, golf courses and other important uh, artifacts in our society. These ranchettes um, uh, have fancy names, 
when you buy them, and they always look exactly the same. You know, the house is called the Scarsdale or the uh, the um, Stonely, spelled S-T-O-N-E-L-E-I-G-H, and then it looks just like everything else. And um, we were asked to see what we could do, and we could fix up the plan a little bit, but that wasn't very important. The plans are usually pretty good, given the parameters. But we were able to make, with very modest decorative maneuvers on the facade, architecturally rich facades that actually began to look like the names of the houses that they had, and began to deal with such problems as taming the beast of the garage. You will notice the garage is the single, single largest element in the facade. But that gives you an idea of the size of the house. and the. But, but I think nobody wants to know that his garage is the biggest room he has. Um, <laughs> It, 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 is, it is sometimes uh, questionable, I realize, but, but not everybody wants to live that way. And so through the use of traditional language, um, used somewhat traditionally, um, I think we were able to develop a certain richness and a certain iconographical meaning to these buildings that they don't have or didn't have before. Classicism, as I tried to say before, is a kind of public language. It is redolent with meaning, whether Aldo Rossi uses it or I use it, or Michael Graves, or whomever. It is, it is, we are turning to it, I think, as I observe my colleagues um, and myself, I think about what I'm doing, because it really is something that does mean things. So when a client asked me to do a, a bed, a nuptial bed for his, him, him and his intended, um, uh, <laughs> needless to say, they tried out a few before, um, <laughs> such is the way things go, uh, I decided to do a temple of love. and. Um, <laughs> Or when asked to remodel a loft in Soho, uh, our New York equivalent of Venice, um, in which the developer had um, taken a 140-year-old building and uh, absolutely destroyed the interiors by ripping off all the plaster because he, that's what he believed was a truly artistic interior. Um, so you expose all the hideous brick walls that were never meant to be shown of the neighboring of this building. We decided that we had to do a kind of transformation on the space. It was a very large space. Um, the question was, how could we make it seem both more intimate and more, 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 more intricate, and um, how could we deal with those terrible brick walls? So the transformation was to make it read like the outside space between two walls of existing buildings on the side. Therefore, classicism, which is a kind of representation of structure on facades of buildings, was used. There are columns that are fully in the round that support lights, and they look like lampstands in a nice park. Um, the, then the couches look like benches, perhaps. Then there are walls that are crumbling. I got the Michael Graves crumbling technique um, <laughs> from him to reveal Frank Gehry's stud walls behind. <laughs> Who says I don't learn from everyone? <laughs> and then the, the, the room up above then looks like some house leaning, looking out onto this room, and so forth. The classical language is surely not the only thing that made this reversal possible, but it does um, work. Some of it is, uh, um, is now finished. Um, a construction photo of a couple of weeks ago. Some of the columns are in the round. Some are in silhouette um, to, to suggest that the relationship between the forms uh, uh, and, and, and the highest ones as seen in the forum is rather tangential. These are sort of small scale representations of, of, the, of the tradition. The dining room table um, was the inspiration for the uh